Welcome to Babel, Translating the Middle East, a podcast from the Middle East program at CSIS. Here on Babel, we take you beyond the headlines to take a closer look at what's happening in the Middle East and why it matters. The war in Gaza has reportedly claimed the lives of over 10,000 Palestinians, and no end to the conflict is in sight. Still, Western analysts are increasingly focusing on what comes after the war. This week on Babel, I'm joined by Khalil Seir, a Palestinian political analyst from Gaza who lived in Ramallah before coming to the United States for graduate school. We talk about what analysts are getting wrong about Gaza, how misinformation is being spread by both Palestinians and Israelis, and why grassroots peace efforts need to change in the aftermath of the conflict. Then I continue the conversation with Natasha Hall and Leah Hickert, discussing the information landscape and the challenges of grassroots mobilization in peacebuilding. To translate some of what's happening in the Middle East, this is Babel. Khalil Sayer is a Palestinian political analyst currently living in Washington, D.C. He was born in Gaza and lived in Ramallah before coming to the U.S. for his graduate studies. Khalil, welcome to Babel. Thank you, Sean, for having me. What's your family story? Well, I was born to a normal Palestinian family in the Gaza Strip who happened to be both refugees. My grandparents have been displaced in 1948 during Nakba from a city called Mashdal, actually, located in the south part, the property of Israel. And my mother's side actually, interestingly, came from Akko, so from up in the north, both ended up in Gaza. So born to a Palestinian family that are refugees means that, you know, you have to grow with a sense of grievances toward what happened in 48, and also with a sense of hope that one day you'll return to what used to be your home in 1948. You grew up in Gaza. What was it like growing up in Gaza? This is a hard question because when someone asks me this question, I find myself going deep into my thoughts and emotions and imagining all sort of paradoxes about the way I grew up in Gaza and the context there on the one hand, I grew up into a really beautiful city on the beach. I lived just five minutes from the Mediterranean. I would walk and I would enjoy the sun over there. And on the other hand, since my childhood, I've experienced the Israeli bombing of Gaza during the Second Intifada. I also experienced the Hamas takeover of Gaza in 2006. I experienced the bulletization of every aspect of life in Gaza after 2006. My grandparents from my mother's side lived in Ramallah and up until I was 14 years old, I wasn't able to meet them because I couldn't travel from Gaza to Ramallah, which is for context. It's about like 40 miles or less, which you drive even like an hour here in the U.S. But you couldn't even leave because you needed an Israeli permit. And then you moved to Ramallah. How is it different from what you knew in Gaza? How is life in Ramallah different? How is society different? How are Palestinians different? The first thing that any Palestinian who grew up in Gaza, especially after the total siege and isolation of Gaza would tell you is geographically different. The fact that you can see mountains, you know, people in Gaza have grown up on the coastal, never seen a mountain in their lives. But on the other hand, there is certain cultural differences because of the regime type that we had, right? Since Hamas took over in 2006, especially during the first few years of Hamas's consolidation of power in Gaza between 2006 and 2009, there have been really harsh process of Islamization of society, making it more Islamist, making it more look like what Hamas want the regime to look like and the people to look like. And that's something that didn't happen in the West Bank. Due to the secular nature of the PLO and the Fatah movement there, life has remained a little bit more secular in the West Bank. And I'll give you one example. In Gaza, after 2006, it wasn't allowed for people to consume alcohol anywhere in Gaza, not the restaurant, not even in your private home. So I was born to a Christian family. By virtue of being Christians, we have wine at home usually. But not only this, even the economy in the West Bank after the siege obviously was a little bit better and you could feel it. You could feel that there is more opportunity that you could go to school and have a hope, higher chance of getting a job. And you know, I, I lived Gaza at the age of 15 and although I was 15, Unfortunately, I was able to predict that the situation going to get worse and worse, and that's why I decided to go there. I said, at least there is a higher chance of getting a job and getting a life after university. And unfortunately, I was right, because the situation became worse and worse. Have you been back to Gaza since you left? I was not allowed, no. 
Not allowed by Hamas or not allowed by the Israelis? By the Israelis mostly. I think that Hamas would have issue with me going back to Gaza because they have issue with anyone who went to the West Bank because they associate them usually with the other party, with Fatah or with other groups, right? Just the fact that you went to Ramallah, this make you suspicious. But no, it was more from the Israeli side. You know, for almost seven years living in the West Bank, the Israelis consider people like myself who moved there as quote-unquote illegal. So at any point, an Israeli soldier can stop you, send you back to Gaza without any warranty. So I lived under this fear for almost seven years, running away from the army, having to figure out how to get my papers. And then 2000. 17, for the first time, I got what's so called quote unquote permit to stay in the West Bank. It's you know, renewed in a yearly basis. And I had the freedom to travel freely in the West Bank and then the freedom for the first time to go out of Palestine to Amman, Jordan. And when I came to pursue my academic degree here in the US, I was shocked that I'm not allowed back to the West Bank. They just revoked the permit. So now I'm kind of stuck here. It's a good place to be stuck in, but. What citizenship do you have? I have only a Palestinian Authority citizenship. So. I have a passport that is not recognized by every, I mean, yeah, some would say it's recognized by every state. Others would say it's only travel document, but it's a Palestinian Authority passport. That's the only one I have. And so you only have Palestinian citizenship, but you can't go back to any place? No, because I can't go to the West Bank because they revoked the experiment, although that's the place I know for the last 14 years. I lived in Ramallah, my undergrad studies in Bethlehem, so that's the place I knew, right? Gaza, to me, is where my family is. I mean, my siblings are there, my father and mother are still there. But to me, going there means losing every economical opportunity. I mean, I'm seeing my siblings suffering there and not being able to get a job. Even my dad business was destroyed. Everything is being destroyed. And on the other hand, too, living under an Islamist authoritarian regime, to me, is not my thing. I can't live there. I can't live and not being able to criticize the government freely. I can't live there and not be able to just wear whatever I want to wear or hang out with female friends or whatever. I mean, all these sort of restrictions by the Hamas regime in Gaza. So that's why I decided not to go back to Gaza. So you've seen a lot of people in the United States talking about Gaza for the last month, especially. What do you think Americans get most wrong about Gaza? What do people just not understand? I think people misunderstand the diversity of Gaza. Gaza is much more diverse, especially Gaza City. It's an actual cosmopolitan city. I mean, actually, it's the most populated city in the, in the Palestinian territories. I mean, compared to other cities, it has a serious middle class that was destroyed, obviously, after the siege, but the culture is still there. Education rate is very high. Even for women, it's above 90%. But the other thing that they get wrong is that they assume that everyone in Gaza elected Hamas in 2007. And thus, you know, I hear a lot of people argue that they have to obey the consequences of what happened, the horrible thing that happened in October 7th, right? And this cannot be far from the truth because not only that like 50% of the Gaza population today are children and even people like myself did not elect Hamas because we weren't eligible for election in 2006 when I was like, what, 12 or 13 at the time. But even on a factual basis, people did not really elect Hamas by majority in Gaza. What happened is about 45% of the people voted for Hamas. And even within the 45% who voted for Hamas, I would argue that a lot of them do not support the sort of quote-unquote resistance program of Hamas. I mean, the data shows clearly that after the election majority of people who voted for Hamas were actually also supportive of two-state solution and negotiation with the government. So there is a paradox there to like struggle with and deal with. I think people like to look at Gaza without really realizing the complexity of it. On the other hand, also I am, to be honest, frustrated by certain people on the far left who tend to just think of Hamas as only resistant movement and not to understand that this is a movement that has controlled Gaza for the last 15 years and made the lives of the Palestinians miserable. People like myself and others weren't able to express our political opinions and even like basic liberty of issues. <laughs> and people weren't allowed at some point to like even go on a date without a marriage certificate, etc. So there is all sort of problem with this understanding of Gaza and what's happening there. When did you first meet an Israeli who wasn't a soldier, and what was that experience like? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I have an interesting journey on that, actually. In Gaza, I did not even meet a soldier, actually. The only time I met an Israeli was with the Israeli F-16s coming to the skies of Gaza and bombing. So the first interaction with Israelis is terrifying. 
you know all the stories about what happened in 48. They're bombing you and you don't see them. And the only, to me, rational and logical conclusion I could reach to is that they want to kill us all. They want to get rid of us all. So I've seen them as some form of monsters. And then going to the West Bank, ended up having to run from the soldiers from place to place because I'm quote-unquote illegal under the Israeli occupation law. The first time I met an Israeli who was not a soldier, actually, it was an Israeli settler who is obviously radical in his views of what Israel should look like, etc. But he had certain level of quote-unquote humanism, and he just wanted to meet a Palestinian for the first time. So I did, and at that time, I wanted to just meet an Israeli. I was going through a journey where, for the first time, I started thinking, what if they have a story too, and what if I hear their story? And I wasn't allowed to go into Israel, so I figured that the only place I could meet Israelis is the settlements. <laughs> so I ended up meeting someone at the junction between Bethlehem and Hebron called Goshatzion Junction at a cafe for settlers, actually, where Palestinians can access at that time. I met this in Israeli, and it was fascinating because on the one hand, I disagree with him on almost everything. Like, it's insane to me what he's talking about, right? On the other hand, I've seen just a human who wants to raise his children, who is really sincerely does not want to kill all Palestinians, as I imagined or whatever. And it was really a moving experience after this, I'd met bunch of other Israelis from Tel Aviv and Jerusalem who I aligned with more in terms of like my basic view of the world, right? And now even my business partner in this new organization that was started is an Israeli himself. And we both see the world a little bit closer to each other than the rest of Palestinians and Israelis. Can you describe the pro-peace Palestinian community? Who's in it? How diverse is it? What is it like? Yeah, well, I guess it depends what you mean by propies, right? If you mean people who support two-state solution, I would say historically, within the last 10 years, majority of Palestinians are in this camp for different reasons, right? The numbers used to be at between 50 to 65, right? Depends on what's happening in the context. People swing back and forth. Right now, given the context that the Israeli government continues its occupation, expansion of settlements, etc., this camp is getting weaker and weaker. So we know in numbers that people who support two-state solution are less than 40%. But if we mean by peace camp, what some Westerns refer to as people who have worked on grassroots between Israelis and Palestinians, like myself, I would say that this groups are still quite weak, and I don't think they are up to the challenge of what's up ahead of us. And I think that's due to the really huge inequality between both sides, Palestinians and Israelis, and the institutional problem that the occupation has created. So that's complicated. <laughs> I wish I had a more simple answer to that, but I had to learn this the hard way after really working for years to trying to get more of my friends to participate in meeting Israelis. And I did succeed sometimes. I failed much more time. How large is that community in your mind? Is this a community of dozens, hundreds, thousands? I think the maximum would be 10,000. Yeah, that would be the maximum. If I combined all the organizations, you know. But obviously, I mean, this includes some Palestinian citizens of Israel. This is a different equation because Palestinian citizens of Israel, by the very virtue of being Israelis, have to deal with their neighbors, right? And also there is certain level of equality there where you could meet with each other. The Palestinians find it very humiliating and hard that we are going to meet with the Israelis and at the same time having to go through checkpoints where we are humiliated, having to require permit, etc. And then when you sit there, they come and they assume that you guys are equal. And I always had to like point out to my partner and say, despite that we are equal in this room, if something happens and the police comes here under the law, we're not equal. And that makes it almost impossible for any grassroots peace initiative to succeed. That's why I kind of stepped back from this work and now building this organization with my Israeli partner where we're trying to get people together, but we no longer talk about peace and love or whatever. We are talking about ending the occupation. We're talking about the political settlement that after this, we'll start talking about talking to each other more. But now the conversation has to be about everything that we want to talk about, about our identity, etc. But it has to be all directed as the goal of ending the occupation, establishing some form of solution where Palestinians have right and dignity and no longer feel that they are under the... Many Palestinians would describe the boots of the Israeli soldiers. What has the current war done to those kinds of efforts? Is anything going on? Can anything go on? Under what circumstances can anything go on? If so, what? 
I mean, obviously I'm here in the US, I'm not there on the ground, so this gives me a lot of disadvantage, but I think also it gives me an advantage because I'm able to see the bigger picture. And at the same time, I'm here in Washington, but my phone from the day to the night, I'm talking to people in Gaza, talking to people in the West Bank, and also in Egypt and Jordan as well. And what I can tell you that a lot of organizations that has had Palestinians and Israelis working together in grassroots has completely collapsed, like people no longer trust each other. Even I've seen people having completely different versions of what happened on October 7th. The Israelis were like, there is a horrific, terrible massacres are happening. And some Palestinians were like, no, nothing really is happening. Only soldiers were killed, whatever. I've seen also Israelis saying that while we still believe in peace, we think the IDF should have complete freedom in Gaza, right? They should just massacre people. It's all collateral damage, no problem. And I had a conversation with different groups that I was working on. Again, I said, the problem is not that you're doing something wrong. The problem is that you're operating within a very hard context. And this is an institutional problem that unless it ends and both sides are closer to each other in terms of equality, this will keep happening. So in a way, maybe the entire premise or foundation of the grassroots work is wrong, in a way. You talked about how you're monitoring this war from far. Can you describe what it's like to watch a war affecting a place you know well from afar? How much of what you get is off social media? And how do you think about social media in that context? I think to start with, how does it feel on a personal level? It's painful, it's draining, and it's triggering. Because you see, you know, just two days ago, I saw a face of this young, handsome doctor who was killed with an Israeli airstrike in Gaza, Maisar al -Rayas. I even retweeted the, his story. I thought, wow, what, what a handsome guy and really seems brilliant. He had his master's in Kings in London. I was like, where do I know this guy from? Like, I've seen him. And just like two minutes after I remember, he was my classmate. And I just find myself crying. All of a sudden, just my memories of like, you know, playing with my Sarah, doing homeworks together, etc., start coming back. And relatives of mine were killed. My family home was bombed. They are at the church right now. But even the church was bombed. It's really, really painful. But social media, to be honest, has been great in the sense that it's providing a lot of information and there is no longer monopoly over the narrative. But on the other hand, the amount of misinformation is beyond description. It's really insane on both sides. The Israelis are spreading really well done misinformation. And so is not necessarily only Hamas, but any different pro-Palestine groups are providing also misinformation. There was a bunch of videos of like Hamas bombing tanks that were actually not from Hamas war, but it was from Syria. And that's, especially in Arabic social media, this has been circulating in order for the Islamist movement in the region to show how the way of quote-unquote resistance is succeeding, right? And even like pictures and videos from Ukraine is being circulated as Hamas is fighting in Gaza. On the Israeli side, there were some recording. I mean, after the infamous hospital bombing, right? There were a lot of rumors on who did it or who didn't do it, etc. The recording that Israel has published the day after, to me, it took me two minutes as someone from Gaza who knows the accent, who knows the people, how they talk there, to just figure out this is clearly fabricated. It wasn't serious. It wasn't Hamas operative. Not only the accent, not only the way that they talk is awkward, but also that Hamas operative in Gaza don't talk on cell phones these days. They have their own internal system. So there is all sort of misinformation like that. Pro-Israel groups were publishing pictures of someone who's supposed to be dead and he's like on the coffin and he's like looking in his phone and they're writing, oh, this is Bollywood, right? This is the Palestinians playing dead whatever. And these pictures weren't even from Palestine. Or, I mean, actually some serious people even published pictures of people who pretend to be dead, but they're not dead. And it turns out it's a picture from Paris or Belgium of people who were protesting. So there is tremendous amount of misinformation there. Do you feel that in general, people have a good sense of the reality? Or do you feel that as somebody who really knows Gaza, you don't understand? Or do you feel that this is just being constructed by each side, neither one of which has a, a grip on reality? I would say that anyone whose take on it is either or is missing the point. And I'll give you an example. One of the famous Israeli claims is Hamas is using the Palestinian people in Gaza as human children, right? That Hamas is building tunnels under people's homes 
and Hamas is responsible for every killing of Palestinian and civilians in Gaza. On the other side, on the pro-Palestine side, the argument is just simple. This just simply does not happen. Hamas never built tunnels under the people houses in Gaza. Now, my view is both of these takes are completely wrong because I know for certainty that Hamas is building tunnels under people houses without their permissions. Why? Because I have friends who were targeted because of that. And after their houses were targeted, Hamas rebuilt the tunnels and to just simply dismiss these actual people who are suffering because of Hamas' system of tunnels is completely wrong. On the other hand, to just say that Israel has the right of do whatever they want because just Hamas built a tunnel, killing civilians, killing children, more than 4,000 children were killed in Gaza, just completely terrible and wrong. And it completely disregard all the rules of war and international law, humanitarian law as well. So that's an example of how people misunderstand Gaza and what's happening there. Is there a role for others? Is there a role for other Arab states? Is there a role for Western states? How does that compare to, because you've done a lot of things between Palestinians and Israelis. What do you wish there were from outsiders? I think that obviously the American role is the biggest role, right? The Oslo Agreement, right, wasn't really <laughs> an American initiative by itself, but but the American role played part, right? The fact that the Americans were pushing for it, the fact that Americans weren't willing to give a blind eye to the occupation completely, played a role of pushing the Israelis. I mean, the Israelis depend on America with their weaponry. I mean, we've seen Mr. Biden visiting Israel right away, providing them with weapons, support internationally, even vetoes on the UN, etc. The Israelis need to feel the pressure from America in order to go forward. And the Palestinians need to feel that there's someone pushing for something in order for them to sit on the table. So that's where I think the Western part is very important. On the Arab part, I think that although they are doing their part of trying to push for a solution, I think much more work is needed there. I think that after the Abraham Accord, there has been some misunderstanding of how much the issue can be inflamed in one minute. Like, they just thought the status quo can continue. We could wait to talk about two states, whatever. <laughs> Even the Saudis were, like, kind of willing to move forward with just few steps without two states, whatever. I think for the first time, everything is just going back to the Arabs, and the Arabs just understand at this moment that this is in our interest to push for a Palestinian state, because that's the only way, not only to ensure Palestinians have rights, but to ensure that Egypt and Jordan are more stable. And I would argue that the status of even democratization in the region lays in Israel and Palestine, that when you really solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you will have much more room even to move toward a better status of human rights and democratization in the region. And this is a whole other conversation, but I do believe that. You've devoted a lot of your efforts to trying to pursue some sort of Palestinian-Israeli peace. As you look at the situation now, what drives you to despair and what gives you hope? What drives me to despair, obviously, the fact that we are killing each other in, in a vicious way. I mean, Palestinians and Israelis have been killing each other for the last 75 years. I obviously would emphasize that Palestinians have been disproportionately targeted and killed due to the imbalance of power within the conflict we are living under occupation, humiliation, etc. It did not all start in October 7th. It was much, much longer before that this whole thing was going on. But this episode of violence that we are experiencing right now is not something that we had in terms of proportionality. And it does drive me to despair, the fact that more than a million people in Gaza are displaced. The fact that I lost friends and kids of my friends that were murdered does lead me to despair. And it's painful. My fear is that we are yet again raising up a new generation that is deeply traumatized and that is in deep, deep pain. And that the only way they would find ahead of them is that the way of revenge. And that is a terrifying situation. On the other hand, what gives me hope at this moment is that, paradoxically as it is, after all what is happening right now, finally the world is yet again looking at Gaza and looking at the West Bank, looking at Palestine and saying, guess what? There is a problem there. There is a conflict that has been going for 75 years old. And that gives me hope, although it's annoying and although it makes me feel like I've been speaking up in the air and no one was listening for the last few years. But this gives me certain level of hope that the world is paying attention again to it. And I hope that the Palestinians and Israelis would come to the conclusion that a peaceful means is better than violence. That's my hope. 
Khalil Sayer, thank you very much for joining us on Babel. Thank you, John. I really appreciate it. Right now, our televisions, computers, and phone screens are flooded with information about the Israel-Hamas war. How can anyone rise above the roar of claims and counterclaims when there is just so much global engagement on this issue? It's hard. You know, I think in many ways you had an era of television and before that radio where there are a really limited number of narratives. And I think we've fallen into a place where it's almost entirely choose your own adventure. People have completely different heroes. People have completely different victims, completely different narratives. And you can customize it with all flavors and stripes and with social media and Internet searching and myriad of publications, everybody's individual information stream is totally different. I think our jobs as an analyst are different, too, because we're talking to very different kinds of audiences, all of whom interpret our words differently. So it used to be that you sort of could be part of a conversation. It was one conversation. I think we're in a place where one of the things I'm always thinking about is, so if somebody's coming from a very different perspective, will they think this word means what I intend it to mean? And that's very different. I think a lot of people trying to get attention out there, but it's also hard to sustain listeners because there may be small things that trigger people and say, well, I'm not going to listen to him anymore. Or she's totally, you know, in the pocket of these people. And that's, I think, become more and more of a challenge in the current environment. This is a different kind of war than even any Arab Israeli war we've seen before. But I think it's a different kind of war than any war we've seen before. Billions of people really care. And they're coming out, there are more than a billion different narratives. Yeah, I mean, I've been talking to a lot of people who are experts on open source investigations and disinformation. I mean, these are people that have looked at the Syria conflict, which was just rife with disinformation, Ukraine, which was also rife with disinformation. And these people who have been looking at this particular issue of misinformation and disinformation and how quickly it spreads, not just ones that are instigated by governments, but just regular people who, like John was saying, they genuinely care probably and that they just keep making things go viral that might not necessarily be true or be quite volatile. And these people are saying they've never seen anything like what they've seen in the past month. And that's quite incredible because (laughs) there has been so much disinformation in the past, you know, 15 years, especially with the rise of social media. And what I've been quite surprised by is is not just the social media, but the websites that have proliferated. I saw this with Syria, but I'm seeing it now, and it's dangerous. I mean, there's sites out there with people's personal details, you know, I mean, basically hit list websites. I mean, this is the thing that we fear when disinformation and misinformation actually move towards active violence. And that's what kind of scares me about all of this noise, because the noise and the counter noise drown out anything else, drown out the Khalils, drown out us. And it makes it really difficult to think beyond, you know, this month of violence. You know, if you think about it, and and Natasha, I'm sure you remember, there was something called the Electronic Intifada. And it was one of the early efforts to provide an alternative narrative to mainstream narratives about the Intifada 20 years ago. The, The difference of what's happened to the World Wide Web The idea that there would be an electronic intifada would be a central place where scholars would get together and they would write essays and they would try to enter the conversation. I think that's where we were in the last major Palestinian-Israeli conflict. This is decentralized. It is thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are trying to do anything to steer the narrative, get attention, elicit emotions on all sides of this conflict. And I think it's much less of a conversation than it ever has been. And it's hard to separate the signal from the noise. Sometimes when we have these complex, seemingly intractable conflicts, it's easy to assume that any process of reconciliation has to start by targeting the hearts and minds of the actors involved. However, 
Khalil said something interesting. He said, oftentimes grassroots peace building actually requires more tangible objectives like finding a political settlement or ending the occupation. Where else in the region have we seen the hearts and minds strategy of peace building succeed? Or where have we seen it fail? I think we see this all over the region, but the world as well. I think often donor governments, UN agencies, they try to build up these sort of grassroots movements. And there's many of these. There's little projects here and there in in Syria and elsewhere. I think that the issue is it's good to humanize people, humanize the other side in a sense. But if there's such a dramatic power imbalance and if there's no movement on an actual peace process, it tends to just feel very hollow and sometimes damaging. And you see that, I think, throughout the region. I think that's why a lot of these peace projects have kind of fallen apart, as Khalil was saying, because both sides start mistrusting each other. It just doesn't make sense anymore to think that it's just about needing to meet the other side. Yeah, I think there's also an extent to which when people get together, the disparities between them are even more apparent. And and Khalil talked about this a little bit when he talked about just the disparity in Israelis who can move and Palestinians who can't. I mean, it's hard for Palestinians to move around the West Bank. It's much easier for Israelis to move around the West Bank. And that's just the beginning of it. And there's a danger that people who are in privileged positions come to say, see, there's not really a problem because these people won't talk to us. And the people who are in disadvantaged positions say I, the disparity between me and the other person is even larger than I thought it was. And it can sort of reinforce a sense of resentment. On the other hand, and it's very important, Khalil said, I couldn't imagine what talking to Israeli would be like. And so it's important to have some of that going on too, that there is a humanization. There is a sense that, that people are complex. As both of you know, the Middle East program t-shirts have printed on the back of them, the essence of tyranny is the denial of complexity. A quotation from the Swiss social historian Jacob Burkhart. If there is no interchange, it gives advantages to people who say there's nothing complicated here and there's nothing much to work with. But if it's merely about getting people together and doesn't move anything, doesn't make a change in the reality, doesn't begin to address the disparities. So I think it's an important element, but it can't be a substitute for a much broader set of actions. I'm not sure the conflict can be completely resolved, but I'm sure it can be handled a lot better than it's been handled. And I think an element of that has to be people understanding the complexity and diversity of the other side. And I am convinced by talking to a lot of Palestinians and a lot of Israeli Jews, that there is not nearly the understanding of the complexity and diversity of the other side that there needs to be. For the reasons you just mentioned, John, it can be just as difficult to foster grassroots peace building as it can be to broker a political settlement. Given the difficulties of both bottom-up and top-down peace building, how can Track 2 meetings and other kinds of direct encounters pave a path forward? I've done a lot of track two meetings for probably 30 years on a whole range of issues. I was involved with Iranians, with Syrians, with Palestinians and Israelis, with all series of governments that have had problems with the United States. I've spoken to Chinese, I've spoken to Russians. I think there are useful things that happen in track two meetings, part of which is portraying the diversity on each side, part of which is, is explaining some of the constraints on each side. I think you hear things that give you ideas for experiments to try. You know, one of the things I dealt with Jake Sullivan a bunch before he was national security advisor. And one of the things that Jake likes to say is, you know, well, how would you test that proposition? And I think track two meetings are a really good place to come up with propositions to work with. I was doing track two, track 1.5 negotiations before coming to CSIS. I'm always torn about it how useful they are, because often I think countries can use these tracks to just sort of drag negotiations without really doing anything. That said, I think it's a great avenue for de-escalating tensions, potentially. It's a good avenue for when two sides or three sides or however many 
are not interested in the publicity of a big plan or a big sort of diplomatic battle at the top, and they want just sort of different types of avenues and channels to address just certain things, you know, de-escalation, it could be, you know, water sharing, whatever it happens to be. In those situations, I think it can be tremendously useful. And like John was saying, I think sort of testing different propositions, testing the waters to see if people are ready to talk, for example. I think the Israeli Palestinian conflict for many reasons is is one of the harder ones, but maybe it's time to actually start thinking about it because if there's no Palestinian government, then it's going to have to be track two negotiations. There's going to have to be some kind of other formation to move something forward that's more sustainable, more peaceful, and more equitable. And so I'm glad to see the sort of trajectory of people like Khalil that have noticed this and said, we just, we need to get back to basics and the actual process and the actual institutional and structural failures. And so I'm very cautiously hopeful in this very, very desperate moment. Thank you both for joining me, John and Natasha. Thanks, Leah. Thanks for listening to Babbel. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find more analysis on this topic linked in the show notes on the CSS website, and you can find us on Twitter at CSIS Mideast. Thank you.